I would like to know how many of you ever read the labels on your medicine. Do you, do you, do you, do you, read, do you read the stuff that's on there? You know, yeah, yeah. I, I, I love to watch the commercials on TV when they talk about medications. You kill you. You have this problem. We have the wonder drug. But, you know, and they'll go down the whole list of things that could happen to you. I always love the one where they go, but there's this possibility of a rare, doesn't happen very often, but it does happen, you know, and it's always fatal. <laughs> now, when I hear those commercials of those various uh, pharmaceutical drugs that they have nowadays, what I hear is, this is a great drug, but somebody's going to die. <clears throat> and when I get that drug and I think to myself, am I going to be that one? <clears throat> I don't think I'll take this thing. I'm going to suffer. <laughs> I'm not going to take that. But that's, it's kind of a, the way thing, and we don't really spend a lot of time reading warning labels, do we? Because that's just, now my wife does, she, she look, I get, I get these, all this stuff, you know, they're trying to, to, to fix me, which hasn't worked too well, but they, they send me these various pharmaceuticals, and I don't care, you know, what's on them, but my wife looks it up. And she reads, you know, and we get these, you ever get these sheets that come with them, they're 17 pages long, and in the middle is where they tell you the bad stuff. They don't figure that you're going to do that. But uh, uh, then when we find out what it is, I, I set it aside. I, you know, I'll just try to take my chances, right? So as we've been looking at it in last week and, and this week on the doctrine of Scripture, Right? So I'm going to phrase this one, have you read the warning label? That's going to be the, the title of today's message. And we've looked at certain precepts, right? Last week we looked at three, right? Precept number one is you cannot separate the Word of God from the person of God. You can't do that. Now that doesn't mean that you worship the Word. You're not supposed to do that. You worship the Christ who came, who died on the cross to pay for your sin. The Word didn't do that. But, at the same time, you can't separate the Word of God from the person of God because, you know, the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, became our Savior. Sometimes it, it's just easier to say, well, okay, I believe in Jesus. I, I mean... I believe in God, I believe in what he did, but you know, I really don't want to spend any time in this book because, um, I mean, after all, who can understand this stuff, right? I mean, and it's, it's not all that much fun, you know, read, oh, I don't know, I, you read the first and second Kings, there's a lot of cool stuff going on in there, you know, warriors and battles and all kinds of good stuff, right? But we need to understand that in order to, to have a relationship with the God who saves us, we need to read what he wrote to us. This is his letter to us. Second point that was salvation can only be accomplished through information found in the Bible. All right? You can't make it up. You can't, you know, it, it's got to come from here. This is, this is where we get all the information that we need it's not man-made, it's not church ideology, it is what the Bible tells us, who we are, why we need to be saved in the first place, the fact that we're sinners, that we're all sinners, and that we all need to be saved, and that Jesus was the one who came as God the Son, who died on the cross to pay for our sin, and that's how our salvation is accomplished. And it can only be found, that information can only be found here. Okay? Precept number three.
The Bible does not contain the Word of God. It is, in its entirety, the Word of God. One of the interesting things that they like to sneak in on you is that, well, not everything in here is the Word of God. There's just some things that are in here that are the Word of God. And so, you know, you, you, you take the good stuff and the other stuff you just kind of throw off to the side as somebody's story. Right? We need to understand that the Word of God in its entirety is that from God is his word to us. How do I know that? Well, because all scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 3, all, right? All the good word. I love that word. If you take anything away from all, what is it? It's something else. I don't know what it is, but it's not all, right? So all scripture is given by inspiration, which means God breathed and it's profitable for doctrine, that is what God wants to teach us, for reproof. Remember I told you last week that reproof means the evidence that we need to know who God is. For correction, that's not somebody, you know, God hitting us over the head. Correction is building character. Building character and instruction in righteousness. The Bible teaches you what God wants you to know about himself and the relationship he wants to have with you. I think it's the coolest thing in the world that God wants to have a relationship with us. Right? And it's just, uh, it just boggles the mind that, that God not only created us, God not only uh, enables us, God not only saves us, but he wants to have a relationship with us. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship. And that we find here. The Bible provides the evidence you need to know about the reality of who he is and what he has done. The Bible provides the tools we need to build good character and be in a right relationship with with God. Alright, so that's you know kind of a mini aspect of what we talked about last week. Now I ask you to do some things, right? I said that you should take uh, your Bible and take a notebook and begin to, to look at the first six chapters of the book of Genesis and to uh, ask yourself some questions. Do I believe what I just read? All right? Yes, no, not sure. What question do I have about what I just read? Did the Spirit of God point out something that I would like to remember? And is this a verse or is there a verse out of this that I should memorize? That's how we ought to approach our time in reading the Word. We, you know, I ask you to read the first six chapters, but you know, you might, as you begin to, to develop <clears throat> writing and having this little journal, you might look at one verse or a sentence or a, a paragraph and, and say, now what is it that I just read? And, and, and do I have any questions about what I just read? And, uh, uh, is God trying to say something and speak to me about what I just read? And did I, do, for instance, Genesis 1 1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's a good verse to memorize. Right? In a, in a world and a culture that tells us that that's not the way it happened. Right? We go, wow, the Bible tells me that God created the heaven and the earth. What do we know about Scripture? Scripture, we need to, to memorize. Why? Because the Bible tells us, well, we're going to get to that verse in a minute. Precept number four. The Bible provides the tools we need and the weapons we need to deal with our sinful nature. Okay? We all have a sinful nature. That's just who we are. Right? The Bible provides the tools we need. It gives us the weapons we need to deal with the things that we struggle with in our lives. Here's the verse. Psalm 119.11 Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You. That's the verse I ask you to memorize. Simple one. It's not a hard one. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. But what does that say? 
It says that here I have God's Word, and I'm reading God's Word. Hiding it in my heart means more than just um, memorization. It means that I've looked at it, I've asked those questions, I, 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 I've tried to, to see some things that maybe God's trying to say to me or point out to me. But that aspect of it helps me to deal with things in my own life. If I have a particular issue in my life, and nobody knows the issues you have except you. All right? You might share some of that with others, but you are the one who knows what you struggle with. I know what I struggle with. You know what you struggle with. The Word of God gives us tools that we need to deal with those things that we struggle with. So we begin to find some passages of Scripture, and as we're going through it reading, we go, wow, that really speaks to what I'm dealing with right now. And by the way, we deal with different things at different times in our life, right? And God's Word provides a comfort, it provides advice, guidance, direction, it provides the weapon that says, Satan, you got to leave me alone because... This is what the Word of God says, and it helps me deal with these things. And it says, well, how do I know that? Because it says so. <laughs> I, I have this here that I might not sin. That I might not. I might deal with it. I might be tempted with it. I might struggle with it. But how I deal with what I feel or what's drawing me away, how I deal with that, the Word of God helps me. All right, and that's that's. So important in in all of these. In fact, we talked, we did a series not too long ago on the armor of God, right? In Ephesians, it says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the what? Yeah. Or God. All right? Now, a sword's a pretty good weapon. All right? Uh, I realize, you know, you, nowadays we have different weapons, but back then that was a pretty good weapon to have. A, a good double-edged sword in dealing with things. So the Word of God is a protection against ongoing sin in your life and a weapon against the attack of Satan. Alright? Now, we know that because Jesus gives us an example of when he uses Scripture to defeat Satan's attempt to tempt him. And he was out in the wilderness, right? He, had, he was fasting for, for 40 days. He was, he was out there uh, community with nature and, and with God and all of those things. And Satan comes to him at the end of it, after he's, he's exhausted and he's hungry, right? And he begins to tempt him. He says, look, I, I know you're hungry. Uh, I'll give you some food to eat if you'll just do this or if you do that. And each time, three times, Satan comes to him in this. Jesus expresses his situation through scripture. And I think if Jesus is going to do that, man, that that's something that I'm going to do. Right? If he's going to if he's going to quote scripture in dealing with now, he's Jesus is 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 God, right? He's 100 percent God, 100 percent man. So I mean he, he could have just smacked him one and said, get out of here. Right? But he quotes scripture. He does that specifically so he can be an example to us so that we know how to deal with stuff. All right? And he uses specific scripture that deals with specific temptation. Good stuff. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world, guns and knives and so on. On the contrary, the ones that he has have divine power to demolish strongholds. Sometimes the struggles that we have in our life build strongholds there. They, they, they're there, they get in camp, they get entrenched, and they just, you know, mess with our, our whole psyche, you know. And, and, but the Word of God provides divine power to demolish that. And we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Then I like this. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 
Probably the most difficult thing that we deal with is our thought life. Because a lot of times we just don't have control of all the millions of things that run through our brain. You know? Just, and, and Satan will throw something in the middle of, of our thought life. You know, you know a, a doubt here, a, 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 a seed of distrust, of you know, rebellion. Of, you know, he'll just keep throwing that stuff in. And we think crazy stuff. You know? Uh oh, I don't know. Maybe you don't. I do. <laughs> I, I, I think it's about some of the craziest stuff that just bounces around inside the emptiness here, you know? <laughs> it, it, it's amazing. I go, wow, why did, why, did I even, why did that thought even come to me, man? I, didn't, I don't want to think about that, you know? And, and you have to stop and go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, Lord. I need some help here. You know, and we begin to use scripture. To... If I'm out in, in the woods and uh, I come up against you know, something that, that's, that I need to defend myself against, you know, like a rabbit or something. <laughs> and you know, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to defend myself, right? I'm going to do what I have to do to protect myself, and I'm going to use the weapon, especially if it's a snake. All right? Don't you just love those things crawling all over the place? You know? And I go outside the, in the yard to mow the yard, and, and you know, there's a, a snake there. And I go, well, you're not supposed to be in my yard. I'm mowing my yard. You know? You use what you have to use, right? You, you don't just, you have to have a weapon, right? To deal with this stuff, a stick or something, you know, to move them along. Get them out of the way. So we sometimes don't think about the fact that we have a weapon right here. It's called the Word of God. It's God providing us with the weapons that we need to deal with the stuff that we struggle with. Precept number five, there are passages in the Bible that provide a warning label. Now, let's be honest, we don't really like someone telling us what we can and cannot do, do we? we have any, nobody likes that. I, I never liked it, you know, when my dad used to tell me, you know, you got to do this, you got to do that, and I go, well, yeah, sure, right, you know. <laughs> when, 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 when you did something wrong, especially in church, Dad would come along and say, you know, when we get home, we're going to have a conversation about this. Now, you need to understand that when my dad said that when we get home, we're going to talk about this, he wasn't talking about sitting down on the couch and having a deep conversation. He was talking about something that was going to take place very quickly, very difficult, and I wasn't going to feel good about it when it was over. Okay? So... Uh, we don't like that. So sometimes we don't want to find out what the Bible says because why? I've made choices in how I want to live and I don't need God interfering with those choices. I don't want to read in here and find out that I've made some wrong choices and God says that's not right. You ought not to be doing that. Forget that. Right? We don't want to hear that. We don't want to go through that. Some of you Use equipment, you know, some strange, you know, diff different things. And, and, and sometimes there's warning labels on these big equipments that we use. This one I found, what I found was really interesting because you see how many things that you can't do? You know, it's, all the little circles of the cross, you know, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. And then it has this little thing you probably can't, uh, maybe you can see it there. It says failure to operate. This equipment in accordance could lead to your death. Right? So you get into this big thing and you go, oh, I don't care what all that says. I know how to run this thing, you know. And you go off and, and it gets to be a mess, right? There are warning labels. Danger. Warning. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. This, this is a, 
a thing that can get right down into the middle of stuff that's going on in your life, and you're, you're reading it in there, and, and it says, God says you shouldn't do this, or God is displeased when you do this, or God wants you to go and do this, and, you know, and you're reading that, and you're going, wow, man, I, I didn't want to know that. I didn't want to read that. I, I didn't want that to affect the choices that I'm going to make because I've already made up my mind on how I'm going to live. And now God's coming along saying, you shouldn't do that. And now what do I do? How do I handle this whole thing? It divides even the soul and the spirit. That, that is the, the, the aspect of what's going on <clears throat> inside of me. And then it says joints and marrow. Now I want to, this is kind of interesting because when a sword, a, a sharp sword would, would, would go into you, if it, if it just hit flesh, there was a shock value, but there, there wasn't pain until later. But if it gets into the bone and the marrow, it, it, it really hurts. It's very painful when that happens. All right? And the idea that God's Word is going to be sometimes going to be painful. I, I, I didn't need to, you know, I said, God, you didn't really need to put that in there. <laughs> you, you could have left that part out, that, that reading it and studying it and, and learning about it and about my life. Why can't there just be a lot of good stuff in there? But the idea is that God says, look, the power of God's word sometimes is going to be very painful because it's going to strike at the very heart of who you are, how you're living, and the choices you've made. Not only that, but it discerns your thoughts and your intent. God says, I'll even, I'll even show you what your intentions are. Nothing, that's another all word with more letters. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight, and I don't want to know that. I don't want to know that nothing in my life is hidden from God. That is something that is unnerving. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. I am accountable to God for how I live and responsible for how I think. Okay, that's not something I really want to know. <laughs> Let's get back to the pleasant stuff, Pastor. Okay? Okay. Even if I reject the God of the Bible, I am still accountable. Now, how is that possible? If I, if I don't, you know, if, if I don't believe in, if I believe in God, then I'm accountable with God, but if I don't believe in God, if I don't, I'm religious and I'm, I'm not saved and I'm an unbeliever, I don't, I don't have to worry about any of that, right? John 3.18 says, He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is what? Condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. See, even if I reject God, I'm accountable to God. Even if I don't believe, I'm still accountable. I'm already under that sentence. Romans 14 says, For it is written as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God, so that each of us shall give an account of himself to God. <clears throat> Ooh. Okay. So, Read the warning, believer. Read the warning. What warning? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, that's got nothing to do with where you're going. If you're a believer, this is the judgment seat of Christ. It has nothing to do with with. The fact that you're going to spend an eternity in heaven, it has everything to do with our rewards. 
It has to do with how God rewards us for how we've lived. But more than that, it's standing before God, before Jesus himself, and Jesus saying, you know what? I had so much that I had for you and you missed it. Or you didn't miss it. <laughs> and, or you could have accomplished so much in the power of God, but you didn't trust me. But you know what? I forgive you. You're forgiven. You're going to spend eternity with me. But I just wanted you to know what could have been. Hmm. Okay. Read the warning. Unbeliever. Then I saw a great white throne in him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now that's not a pretty thought at all, is it? Whether I'm a believer or an unbeliever, I'm an accountable to God. And so we need to read the warning label. Where's the warning label? In God's Word. God's Word is the warning label. I read it. I learn what God wants me to do, how He wants me to live, what He has done for me, the relationship He wants to have with me. One of the most beautiful things about the Word of God is to understand that I am a new creature. When I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, He cleanses me of my sin, and I'm a new creation. Old things are passed away. Amen. All things become new. I'm cleansed. All that bad stuff is washed away and I'm now a new creature in Christ. That's good to know. And each day I get to know Him more, the power of God changes my life. But for those who don't know Christ as Savior, the warning label, label is clear. There is an eternity. There's an accountability. And I have to face that. The Bible also provides a true path between man-made differences. Oh, okay. You, we sang this, right? Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Back then, they didn't have flashlights. All right? What they did have was a little bitty wooden bowl. And a little bitty wooden bowl was put on your sandals. And in that little bitty bowl was a candle. And you lit the candle, and when you were walking, especially down the mountain road, that hat was able to light, give you enough light that you could see so that you couldn't fall over the edge. All right? That's what this word is. It's, it's a lamp to my feet. I can... I can See where my feet are going. It's a light to my path. This candle light. Now, I don't know how big the candles were. Probably not that big. But enough, they were wide, and they were enough to be able to, to see your next step. Not, you know, 100 yards down, but your next step. So the Bible provides the next step. I can see where I'm going and my next step. Maybe I can't see into the future, but I can see my next step. It helps me to navigate between legalism and liberalism. Okay. You know, legalism and liberalism. A lot of cool stuff. I, I thought that would... Legalism is following a set of man-made rules which they say is going to result in holy living. All right? Don't do this, don't do that, don't go here, don't go there. When I was growing up and, and, and in church, uh, I don't, you couldn't do anything, you know. It was a sin to spit on the sidewalk. You, 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 could, you couldn't do anything. It was pretty bad. And if you followed all these rules, somehow or another, this was going to, to make you a better Christian. 
need to understand that 99% of the stuff that comes out of that isn't in God's Word. It's man's idea of what's in God's Word. No. So, live this way. Right? But it's not here. If it's not here, then it ought not to be imposed on me. However, out of that came the whole idea of let's get free from all of this. Liberalism. The church should celebrate the choices I've made because, you know, to reject my choices is hate. Just, you know, this is the whole church, the, the, the Christian community needs to celebrate the choices I've made. Now, uh, there are a lot of life choices that people make that, you know, are not good for them. But hey, we should all just celebrate that. We should all be a part of that. We should, you know, allow, uh, you know, drag queens to read books to our children in libraries, right? We should celebrate that. We, sh we should celebrate the fact that uh, it's okay for me uh, to be addicted. It's okay for me to, to allow my body to, to be messed up through addiction. It, it's just my own choices, right? We should celebrate all of that. Let's be liberal. <clears throat> Neither of those are biblical. Neither side is right. The Bible helps to shed light on the fact that's the light unto my path, right? It's that, that next step. The Bible lights the way to understanding the differences between redemptive hate and rooted hate. Now, when I came up with this theological position some 20 years ago, uh, <clears throat> uh, I, had, I had some, some elders scratching their head. And I said, you need, to, you need to, to think about this aspect because the world today is saying, right, that if you don't accept their choices, then that's hate. You hate me because that's who I am, right? Isn't that what they say? You know, it, it's hate. And the Bible, I've got to be honest with you, the Bible has aspects of hate. It does. God himself says in Proverbs, there are seven things that I hate. And he lists them. Right? And Paul tells us that we're supposed to hate sin. So how do I deal with it? God obviously can't sin. Right? Because he's perfect. He's holy. So his hate is redemptive hate born out of his holiness. So how does that deal with us, okay? Now, listen, Psalms 19 has a lot of cool stuff in it. Through your precepts, I get understanding, therefore I what? Hate. Hate every false way. Now, let me throw one from you from the book of Romans. Don't just pretend to love others, really Love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly what is good. Okay? In other words, I love you as a person, but hate the choices you've made for your life. That's redemptive hate. Now, I know we don't, when my boys were growing up, they would always say, Oh, I hate this, I hate that. I go, Now, don't ever say the word hate. Always say dislike intensely. Right? That doesn't fit the sense very good, really. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I just like intentionally this whole situation. The Bible helps us to understand how we love a person but hate or dislike intensely the choices that they've made for their life. That's redemptive. I want to love you. I'm here for you. But I can't accept how you've chosen to live. Now, rooted hate, on the other hand, I hate you as a person because of who you are and the life choices you've made. 
My hate is built up because of prejudice, because of bitterness, because of anger. Because of all of that, because I'm, uh, I have prejudices in my life, because I, I, have, I have bitterness and, and anger in my life against you, that I hate you as a person, and I, I hate the choices that you make. And there's two different things. And the Bible helps us to understand the differences between the two. If I'm going to love someone who's made a wrong choice in their life, I'm going to really love them. But I'm not going to accept the choices they've made. And that has to be crystal clear to the person. And if they keep saying, well, you, 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 you can't love me without loving my choices. Yes, I can. I can be here for you. I can love you. I can put my arms around you. I can comfort you. I can, you know, I can invite you. I can uh, encourage you. I can be all of these things to you. But I can still tell you that the Bible says that what you're doing is a sin. It's wrong. It's against God's law. It's against what God has for you. It, it, it's not what he wants for you. But I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to love you. There's a lot more that we need to say about this. Unfortunately, it's probably going to be a month before we get back to uh, this because we've got Father's Day and we've got communion and then Tom's going to preach and then we've got the 4th of July and then we'll get back to to this. And I hate to leave you on a cliffhanger you know, on this because there's a lot more that we need to say about this. There's a lot more about the, the doctrine of <coughs> Scripture that we need to talk about. We need to talk about how the Bible provides comfort and guidance and counseling and direction. There's so much here. But these things are, and I, I guess probably I wanted to deal with this because, you know, this is Pride Month, so I wanted to be able for us to understand some things uh, because more and more the culture is saying, you know, well, you, you know, we're not going to let hate win. And I agree with that statement. We're not going to let hate win. We're going to allow love to win. But God's love says, I can love you, but hate your choices. God's love says, Christ died on the cross to pay for your sin regardless of who you are or what you've done. There's no one that's not open or allowed to receive the gospel message and we need to be open to sharing with anyone. Those things are important. And so the scripture tells us how we ought to live, shows us what God wants for us. But more than that, what we talked about last week, is that God provides for each believer the power of the Holy Spirit to be able and enable and empower them to live the life that he's open to us to live. Father, thank you for those things that you have opened to us by your word. It is your word that we have hidden in our hearts that we might not fall prey to the sin that so easily enters our life. That we're able to have the weapons that we need to deal with Satan's attacks on our life. That we're able to get to know you better, to be able to love you more, and to be able to love others more because you loved everyone. But at the same time, brought judgment on sin at the cross. So, Father, I pray that you might help us to begin to understand a little bit about how we can walk each day step by step, illuminated by your word, as we get to know you better. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray, and all God's people say. <laughs> Barbara, if you'll come, we'll...